Hi, welcome back to Unit 3, Shimon Bar Kochba. I'm Rabbi Sandy Zisser, and this is Jews and the History of Messianism. It seems quite interesting to be thinking about the first Jewish Messiah and thinking about Shimon Bar Kochba, because the thing that comes up to mind about Bar Kochba is actually the rebellion that he leads against the Romans. Yet, we're here talking about Shimon Bar Kochba as the first Jewish Messiah, or thought that he was the first Jewish Messiah. So what's interesting is that the concept of our remembrance of Shimon Bar Kochba is about the, his famous role as the outstanding military leader in the rebellion. So here's what the other interesting piece for Shimon Bar Kochba. Even though he lived about 2000 years ago, um, somewhere 100 to 135 CE, we have a lot of information about him. Not just historical evidence, but also archeological materials that are found. And unlike so many of the other messiahs that we know of, like Jesus, or those that we probably don't know of, we actually have a very good full documentation of the story of this first Messiah. Between the colorful Talmudic debates that go on uh, and the uh, letters that we have from Shimon Bar Kochba uh, that, uh, about governmental decrees, uh, we also have found coins that were minted by Bar Kochba during his reign as ruler, uh, and we have a very good picture of who he was and how he led. Now, unfortunately, we have uh, this concept of the beginning of the, in the second century. Rome was really committed to gaining as much land and um, assimilating as many cultures as possible during the second century. And uh, the emperor of Rome at the time is Emperor Trajan. Uh, he has um, his military forces brutally punishing anyone who uh, uprises against him and his uh, army. Uh, there are a lot of um, harsh treatments of people uh, in Libya, Egypt, you know, Mesopotamia. Uh, Iraq, uh, Judea, um, really in Northern Africa, in that Northern Africa, Middle Eastern region. Uh, and when he dies, when Trajan dies in 177 CE, his nephew, Hadrian, takes over as the emperor of Rome. And when he takes over, Hadrian wants to improve on his uncle's bloody reign of terror and tries a new approach to quell the people of the lands that they're taking over. And one such population is the Judean population um, and the, uh, obviously the Jews that are living in Judea. Um, so what he does, Hadrian actually becomes a champion of wanting to rebuild the temple. Okay. And Hadrian offers this project that's pretty much irresistible to the Jews that because with the building of the temple, rebuilding of the temple, that the Jews in Judea assumed that the, it was a signal of a messianic era. And Hadrian starts rebuilding the, the temple in Jerusalem. And, and what's interesting also is that Hadrian puts Unculus, who is the uh, biblical translator and commentary, um, who is also probably one of the more famous converts to Judaism, um, who becomes this major um, commentary on biblical literature, uh, in charge of the building of the temple. And it's really difficult to imagine, like living at this time period and actually seeing the concept of building the plans for the, uh, the temple again. Um, and the amazing 
part of this is that the Jews must have felt that the Mashiach was imminently coming, right? This idea that the temple is being built and it, it's going to be um, completed. But of course, things that are too good to be true usually are too good to be true. And Hadrian is actually warned by several people, including high-ranking officials and the church, that by rebuilding the temple in Jerusalem for the Jews, the Jews might become too powerful and he may not actually be able to control them. So what his initial plans for rebuilding the temple actually um, backfire on the Jews. And of course things go south quickly because what happens in a strange turn of events, uh, Hadrian blames his, the killing of his daughter on Jews, right? and he punishes them with anti-Jewish laws that bar them from entering Jerusalem, from practicing their religion, from doing all sorts of things that, that seemed practical to, to be Jewish. And of, of course, his final step here was to um, convert the, uh, the aborted Jewish temple project into a pagan temple obviously. So he flips it and creates a pagan temple in, in the, instead of creating the uh, Jewish temple that he promised. Many scholars and historians believe that this was actually the moment in which Bar Kokhba, Shimon Bar Kokhba, actually mobilizes himself and can't deal with this any longer. And um, he turns out to be very charismatic. He's a very um, good administrator, he's a good organizer, he, he's a good, um, he's a outspoken individual, and in fact, he, with all this going for him, he really manages to amass a Jewish resistance to Hadrian. Uh, that is pretty formidable. In fact, what he does is that uh, he manages to, to defeat the Roman armies several times, and because of that, uh, the Jews were able to reclaim much of the territory in and around Jerusalem. And actually, they even drove out the Romans from Jerusalem for a brief moment in time. And under Bar Kokhba's leadership, the Jewish army that he amasses continues to grow. And in fact, they actually, the men who serve in this army have almost a fanatical relationship uh, with Bar Kokhba. Yeah, he's very charismatic. He's very popular. He's very much a great leader is, that people want to follow. And um, the Romans notice this, right? and, the, and Hadrian has to do something about it. So what does Hadrian do? So he appoints uh, Julius Severus, who's a general in the Roman army, to actually take care of the Judean problem. And they spare no expense at this. And of course, the Roman Empire has a vast army and vast resources. And what they're able to do is, is Severus goes in to Jerusalem and the surrounding areas, and they besiege the cities, they starve out the people, and they retake the, the fortresses one at a time until the final siege. And Severus encounters Bar Kokhba and his rebellion uh, at the city of Betar, and which is, which is I, I, it's southwest of Jerusalem uh, by about five or 10 miles. It's not very far south of Jerusalem. Uh, and during the time, Bar Kokhba actually not only holds off Severus, but manages to establish a new civil government for Israel at that time and he rules it for three years. Now we know from historical records that Bar Kokhba is a very effective leader and he's rather harsh at certain points and his communications to his officers at times demanded success at the risk of death of their, his officers. Um, and several of the uh, letters that we have found uh, of, of Bar Kokhba to his general show that. So let's take a look at a couple of letters that we have uh, unearthed. 
So all in all, there were about 11 letters written by Shimon Bar Kokhba that were found uh, in caves near the Dead Sea. And the letters are considered one of the most important archaeological discoveries at the time. And the um, letters, two of them written in Greek and the re remainder in Aramaic, were actually written by Bar Kokhba himself to his deputy commander. Uh, Jonathan Bar Baya, and uh, most of them were orders for Bar Baya to arrest certain people or to bring certain people before the commander. And um, they're very imp impressive that we actually found them. So let's take a look. Here is one of the actual letters written by Bar Kochla uh, to his commander. And here's what some of them said. So Shimon Bar Kochba to enter the Masabala, let all men from Tikoa and other places who are with you be sent to me without delay. And if you shall not send them, let it be known to you that you will be punished. Another letter from Shimon Bar Kochba to Yonatan. Peace. My order is that whatever Alicia tells you, do to him and help him and those with him. Be well. Uh, another letter was, I have sent to you two donkeys, and you must send with them two men to Yonatan, son of Be'eyan, and, and to Masabala, in order that they shall pack and send to the camp towards you palm branches and citrons. And you, from your place, send others who will bring your myrtles and willows. See that they are tithed and sent them to the camp. The request is made because the army is big. Be well. And the last one. In comfort you sit, eat, and drink from your, the property of the house of Israel and care nothing for your brothers. This letter, as it says, seems to be a reproach to the men of Ein Gedi because they failed to take part in a battle. Um, it's very uh, telling, but it's also an insight into his, uh, Shimon Bar Kokhba, very precise. Now, if you notice something interesting, his name, Shimon Bar Kokhba, is not Bar Kokhba, and we'll see why in a little bit later when we get to it. So back to our story. So Shimon Bar Kosipa or Shimon Bar Kochba? Well, it turns out that most rabbis of that time opposed the concept of Bar Kochba as the Messiah. And in fact, there was one rabbi who was critical in support of Bar Kosipa as the actual Messiah. And that rabbi was actually Rabbi Akiva who was one of the most famous teachers and sages of the time. And in fact, amazing to us to think that Akiva would actually believe that he was, that Bar Kochba was the Messiah. And I'll, I'll go back and forth his name Bar Kosheba because Akiva actually transformed him into the first Jewish Messiah. What he does is he actually changed the man's name. Uh, he, Bar Kochba, would use the family name of Bar Kosheba, and it was Akiva who actually gives him the name Bar Kochba, meaning son of the star, which is a biblical reference to the Messiah, to the, to the reference of someone being the Messiah. Now, of course, that's an interesting plot twist, and we'll see why that is in a second. So now, remember, setting the stage again. Severus has his army surrounding Betar, where Bar Kokhba and his troops are. Now, do you remember that Bar Kokhba's secret main weapon of resilience and perseverance is the dedication his army has toward him? And without that, he actually is nothing. And what happens is that he takes on a idea of allegiance for Bar Kokhba, 
Now, what's interesting is that Bar Kochba himself actually never declares himself directly to be the Mashiach. Right? On some of the coins that are printed, he has printed on it the Nasi of Israel, the Prince of Israel, not the Mashiach. Now, also, we know for a fact that Bar Kochba is not a descendant of King David. So he doesn't fulfill that requirement for the being the Mashiach either. So what happens then is that he does take some steps as he establishes this new Jewish government in those three years of the revolt that take steps that look like he could be jockeying to be the Messiah. He does actually change some ritual requirements um, and does follow more of Rabbi Shammai than Rabbi Hillel um, in the standard of, of how observances should be done. Hillel is much more of a lenient, rational decision maker when it comes to halacha, when it comes to law. And Shammai, historically, was very much more harsh in his, in his beliefs uh, and how Jewish, uh, Jewish law should be observed. He is a strong military leader, which is sometimes seen as a requirement for uh, the Mashiach based on the latter prophets that we've looked at in Unit 1. But one of the things that really comes about here is that Bar Kokhba became the Messiah or someone believed that, that he could be the Messiah because the people really strongly needed to have a Messiah at that time. It's a very pivotal point. The Jews are suffering under Roman rule. The second temple that is destroyed and is now looks like can be rebuilt by Emperor Hadrian, that's a disappointment. There's a, there's a need, there's a fuel for a Messiah at this moment. And Bar Kokhba seems to be the most popular candidate at the time based on his role in society. But unfortunately for him, not everyone sees him as the Messiah. So one of the things that happens, of course, is that there's a group of rabbis that believe that he is not the Messiah and are set out to, to disagree with him. And one of those people was actually the main rabbinic pushback to people like Akiva, who believed that Bar Kokhba was the Messiah, was that these other rabbis said that, yes, even though Bar Kokhba has a higher observance of Jewish rituals in his personal life, he actually is only relying on the military might of his armies and not actually relying on God for the outcome. And that's sort of a messianic no-do. Right? And unfortunately, um, when the Roman army tries to recapture these fortifications that are taken over by Bar Kokhba and his rebellion. Um, a little over a half a million Jews are, are killed by military action by the Romans. And uh, as a matter of fact, ironically, Rabbi Akiva is one of those who are captured uh, by the Romans and killed. So how does this whole thing end for Bar Kokhba? Well, the answer is not very well. So what happens back in Betar, as the Romans are besieging the city, they come up with a scheme to actually end this battle. And they send in a, a conspirator who is um, a Samaritan uh, who actually confesses falsely that Rabbi Eliezer, who is Bar Kokhba's uncle, is actually working with the Romans to give them the city. And Bar Kokhba gets incensed at this moment and kills his uncle. And at that point in this rebellion, all of the messianic supporters basically of Bar Kokhba realize that this is, he's not the Messiah because the Mashiach would not actually do something like that, according to them. And, and why would they believe that? Because according to legend and, and the latter prophets that we looked at before, the Messiah is someone who judges perfectly not by emotions or feelings, but what the truth is. And obviously, Bar Kokhba 
doesn't actually fulfill that at all. So his supporters dwindle to almost nothing. Of course, what happens after that is that the rabbis come together and they actually execute Bar Kokhba uh, for killing Rabbi Eliezer. And without Bar Kokhba, the Jewish resistance, the rebellion falls apart. And then, of course, what happens is eventually the Romans overrun Betar, killing everyone they could find. So why don't we actually remember Shimon Bar Kokhba as the failed messiah that apparently he was? Well, unfortunately, the uh, the rabbis and Jewish historians say that the tragedy that occurred at Betar, where everyone was overrun and the rebellion was crushed, happened on the ninth of Av, Tisha B'Av, which was also the date of the first and second temple's destruction. So, because of that, because of this this solemn day of Tisha B'Av, of national mourning for both temples we actually remember that more than the failed attempt by a false messiah to uh, win a victory. So he, that part of Shimon Bar Kokhba is almost lost to history. We don't really study that part, um, but in fact, that's who he is. Hope you enjoyed it. See you next.